Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Fernando Florido, a GP in the United Kingdom. Today we're looking at the NICE guidelines for the management of stable angina, specifically from a primary care perspective. Proper management of angina can have a huge impact on patients' lives, and that's why I'm excited to share the latest evidence-based recommendations from NICE. However, it's important to know that I'm here to provide information and interpretation of the guidelines, not medical advice. Always use your clinical judgment when treating your patients. For those of you who are on the go and prefer a different format, there's also a podcast version of these videos. You can find the link in the description below. By the way, please make sure to watch the entire episode as I'll be sharing a fictitious clinical patient created by ChatGPT together with a treatment management. This will give you the opportunity to see practical guidelines in action and understand how they can be applied in real-life situations. So with that said, let's dive in. We will start by addressing the following. To diagnose stable angina, we follow different guidelines set up by NICE on recent onset chest pain of suspected cardiac origin. There's also different guidelines for unstable angina and STEMI and acute coronary syndromes. We'll explain to patients the factors that can provoke angina, such as exertion, emotional stress, exposure to cold, and eating heavy meal. We should also explore any misconceptions and implications for activities, cardiovascular risk, and life expectancy. We will need to advise the patient to seek medical help if there is a sudden worsening in the frequency or severity of their angina. We should give lifestyle advice and psychological support and address self-management skills such as pacing their activities and goal setting, concerns about the impact of stress, anxiety or depression, and advice about physical exertion, including sexual activity. In terms of general principles of treatment, we will say the following. Age alone should not exclude patients from treatment. In terms of preventing and treating episodes of angina, we will offer a short acting nitrate to prevent and treat episodes of angina. We will advise people that they should use it immediately before any planned exercise or exertion. We will explain the possible side effects such as flushing, headache and lightheadedness and to sit down or find something to hold on to if feeling lightheaded and we will advise them to repeat the dose after 5 minutes if necessary and call an emergency ambulance if the pain has not gone. In respect of drugs for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, we will consider aspirin 75mg daily, taking into account the risk of bleeding and comorbidities. We will consider ACE inhibitors for people with stable angina and diabetes. We will offer both antihypertensive treatment and statin therapy in line with the respective NICE guidelines on the subject. Regarding dietary supplements, we will not offer vitamin or fish oil supplements and we will inform patients that there is no evidence that they help stable angina. Optimal drug treatment for the initial management of stable angina should consist of one or two antianginal drugs as necessary plus drugs for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. The aim of antianginal drug treatment is to prevent episodes of angina, while the aim of secondary prevention treatment is to prevent cardiovascular events such as heart attacks and strokes. We will review the response to treatment, including any side effects, two to four weeks after starting or changing drug treatment, and we will trade the dose up to the maximum tolerated dose. So let's have a look at the drugs for treating stable angina. We should offer either a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker as first-line treatment. The decision on which drug to use should be based on comorbidities, contraindications and the person's preference. If the patient cannot tolerate the beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, we will consider switching to the other option. If the person's symptoms are not satisfactorily controlled on a single drug, we will consider either switching to the other option or using a combination of the two. When combining a calcium channel blocker with a beta blocker, we will use a hydroperidine calcium channel blocker, for example, slow-release nifedipine, amlodipine or philodipine. 
It's essential to remember not to offer anti-alginal drugs other than beta blockers or calcium channel blockers as first-line treatment. If the person cannot tolerate beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, or both are contraindicated, we will consider monotherapy with one of the following drugs. A long-acting nitrate, Evapridin, Nicorandol, or Ranolacin. Adding a third antianginal drug for those whose angina is controlled with two antianginal drugs is not recommended. However, it's worth considering adding a third antianginal drug only when the symptoms are not controlled with two antianginal drugs. Deciding which drug to use should be based on comorbidities, contraindications, the person's preference, and drug costs. Now let's discuss recommendations on revascularization procedures when symptoms are not controlled with optimal medical treatment. And these procedures would be either a coronary artery bypass graft or cabbage or a percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI. In addition, we can offer coronary angiography to guide our treatment strategy. The main purpose of risk vascularization is to improve the symptoms of stable angina. However, it is important to explain to the patient that repeat revascularization may be necessary after either a cabbage or PCI, and the rate is lower after cabbage. Stroke is uncommon after either cabbage or PCI, and the incidence is similar between the two procedures. We will take into account that PCI may be more cost-effective than a cabbage. However, in multivessel disease, we need to be aware of the potential survival advantage of a cabbage of a PCI for those who have diabetes are over 65 years of age or have anatomically complex three vessel disease. In terms of pain interventions, we should not offer transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS, enhanced external counterpulsation or EECP or acupuncture. Now let's address stable angina that has not responded to treatment. In these cases, it's important to provide comprehensive re-evaluation and advice. This may include exploring the impact of symptoms on their quality of life and reviewing the diagnosis while considering non-ischemic causes of pain. Additionally, it's essential to review drug treatment and consider future drug treatment and revascularization options. It's also important to acknowledge the limitations of treatment and explain the self-management of the pain. Specific attention should be given to the role of psychological factors in pain and skills to modify cognitions and behaviour associating with pain. In people with angiographically normal coronary arteries and continuing angenial symptoms, we need to consider a diagnosis of cardiac syndrome X. This condition can be challenging to diagnose and additional testing may be necessary. If a patient is diagnosed with suspected cardiac syndrome X, we will continue drug treatment for stable angina only if it improves their symptoms. We will not routinely offer secondary prevention drugs in suspected cardiac syndrome X. This is because the effectiveness of these drugs in this population is uncertain and they may cause unnecessary side effects. Right, so now let's have a look at our fictitious clinical case created by ChatGPT. The patient is John Smith, a 55-year-old man who has just been diagnosed with stable angina. John has a history of hypertension, high cholesterol and type 2 diabetes, which is well controlled with metformin 1000 mg twice a day. He has been experiencing chest pain and shortness of breath during his section for the last six months. He's a non-smoker and leads an active lifestyle, but his symptoms are affecting his ability to exercise. Recent test results show that John's most recent blood pressure reading was 148 over 86. His cholesterol levels were 5.8 millimoles per litre or 224 milligrams per deciliter with an LDL cholesterol of 3.9 millimoles per litre or 151 milligrams per deciliter and HDL cholesterol of 1.4 millimoles per litre or 54 milligrams per deciliter. His HbA1c level was 6.5% or 48 millimoles per mole. How should he be treated? 
In terms of preventing and treating episodes of angina, we should offer John short-acting nitrates to be used immediately before any planned exercise or exertion in the form of a sublingual GTN spray. We should advise him to repeat the dose after 5 minutes if necessary and call an ambulance if the pain has not gone. We should explain the possible side effects of the medication such as flushing, headache and lightheadedness. In respect of drugs for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, we should start John on aspirin 75 mg daily, taking into account his risk of bleeding. We should also consider ACE inhibitors for him as he has stable angina and diabetes. And he could be started on a small dose of lisinopril 2.5 mg daily. In terms of statin therapy, he should be starting on torvastatin 80 mg daily for secondary prevention in line with NICE guidance. He should be advised that there is no evidence to support the use of dietary supplements such as vitamin or fish oil supplements, and therefore we should not prescribe them. For treating John's stable angina, both a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker should be considered as first-line treatment. Because of the patient's concern on erectile dysfunction, we could decide to use a small dose of a calcium channel blocker, for example, felodipine 2.5 mg daily. We will titrate this against his symptoms up to the maximum tolerated dose. John's case should be reviewed two to four weeks after starting his new medication to assess his response to treatment, including any side effects. We should also monitor his blood pressure, cholesterol and HbA1c levels to ensure that it remain within the recommended targets. In conclusion, the management of stable angina requires a comprehensive approach that addresses both the underlying cardiovascular disease and the patient's individual risk factors. By following the general principles of treatment and tailoring the treatment plan to the patient's specific needs, we can help to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events and improve their quality of life. But please keep in mind that this is only a summary and my interpretation of the guideline. Please let me know your views in the comment section below. We have come to the end of this video. I hope that you have found it useful. If so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.